and I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. And Azaret and Graceland, if you don't mind keeping an eye on the waiting room, if you can, at the start. Um, Got it. Okay, cool. So thanks, everybody, for um, logging in to tonight's Academic Showcase, Health Profession. So this is the first time that we've done something like this. Um, so we're super excited. Um, we've got some really, really good people on tonight to talk about um, what they do at IVCC and what their program has to offer. And so please uh, type any questions you have in the chat box um, and we can get to them as we're going along. And then we're gonna leave ample time at the end um, for any questions that you may have as well. Um, but like I said, don't hesitate to, to put a question in the chat box. I'm gonna put something here. Um, let's see. First time on, on the internet tonight. Um, so here we go. So here's who we're going to hear from tonight. We have Heather Sagi, who is the program coordinator for dental assisting, Nick Fish, the program coordinator from EMT EMS paramedic, um, Katie Ritter, the program coordinator for dent medical assisting. Then we have Dr. Jennifer Grobe and Laura Hodgson, both from nursing, and they'll be able to answer any questions about CNA that you may have as well. We've got Roxanne Cherpesky, the program coordinator from therapeutic massage, and Renee Prine is our counselor tonight. She'll talk a little bit about the importance of talking with a counselor. Um, and then I am Quentin Overachter. I can't even say my last name. I am Quentin Overacher, Director of Admissions, Records, and Transfer Services. Um, so like I said, we are just going to kind of get a, a quick overview, five to six minutes from all of the programs and the program coordinators will um, kind of talk a little bit about what they have to offer. As I said, please chat any questions that you may have. Um, and we're just going to get it started. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather Sagi. So Heather, if you want to get started talking about dental assisting. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Heather, and I'm the program coordinator for the dental assisting program. Um, and we're just going to kind of go over the program requirements and length and experience, uh, experiential uh, learning and all that good stuff, the fun stuff. Um, so the program requirements, we have limited admissions. Um, and instead, of, they call it um, applying to the program, but it's called a letter of intent. So it's kind of the same thing. You'd apply to IVCC, and then you can find the letter of intent on the IVCC um, backslash dental webpage. Um, click on letter of intent, and then you can fill it out right there on uh, the computer, and then it automatically gets submitted. So you don't have to mail it in or do anything like that. Um, so it's pretty streamlined, which is nice. Um, the letters are due April 1st for this fall start. We only do start um, each fall. Um, so if they're due April 1st, we do take um, applications after the fact and it's kind of like a rolling admissions until we're, we're full. Um, the program length is one year. So we start in August, um, the start of the fall and you go through July. So from May to July is a 10 week internship, externship um, that you're in a dental office um, working for free, you know, um, you're going to be working in an office for that 10 weeks, getting that hands on experience and with a lot of our offices, I'd say 90% of our students get a job offer for one of the offices that they intern in. Um, so you kind of get your hands in there and figure out if you actually like it and what you want to do and what kind of office you want to work in. Uh, for the learning, we have didactic. So the lect we have lecture portion. Um, as this year, where lecture is going to be kind of blended so some in, and then some face to face so just depending on the class and um, how much we can do online so we're going to try and limit the time that you're on campus as much as we can um, but we need you to the hands-on program so you will be here uh, about half the time um, we have laboratory so whatever we learn in lecture we actually go through in a, in a lab setting so i'm going to teach you how to do it um, via Zoom or lecture, we'll talk about it, kind of go through the steps, and then you're gonna actually do it in the lab. So all, those classes are all tied together. 
um, for clinicals uh, in the second semester. So the spring semester, you have clinicals. So we have live patients coming in from the community, um, students, faculty, community members, uh, anybody can come in for that um, dental clinic and it's free for anybody. It's free for students um, and faculty. Otherwise it's a $30 charge for the community members. Um, but that way you get practice while you're here, you get your instructors to kind of help you out with any questions that you might have. Um, but that's a really good thing. So Fridays, that's our clinical, um, but you do see live patients in the spring semester. And then in the externship, like I said, that's your summer semester. So from May to July um, is when you're actually going to be in a dental office and you'll go to two or three dental offices in that 10 week span, um, just so you have a little bit of experience in different settings. So a busy office, a slow office, a kid office and things like that. So you kind of have an idea. And Sorry, I muted myself somehow. Um, working as a dental assistant, there's lots of different jobs that you can have. Um, so you can be a clinical dental assistant. So you're working side by side with the dentist. Um, you can work in a surgical office. So more extractions and um, oral surgeries and things like that, which is really fun. But if you don't like the blood and stuff like that, that might not be for you. Um, we have orthodontics. So you work in an office and you put braces on kids and, um, or adults and things like that. So that's always fun. That's one of, the off or that's one of our top uh, job placements. Everybody kind of likes to work in the ortho office. Um, we have pedo, which is a children's office. Um, so children's and special needs office. And that is, ju you're just working with kids all the time. So the, again, you kind of get an idea if that's something that you want to do. If you don't like kids, then don't work in a pedo office. That's kind of that kind of thing. Um, endo is going to be, um, is a specialty office, so root canals and things like that. And then you can work in a dental lab. So maybe you just don't like to actually interact with people, um, but you do like the dental aspect and you like the appliances and you like to make things and you're good with your hands and maybe a lab setting is better for you. So you can create that thing, that stuff. And with everything that you learn, you are set up to go into any, any one of those kinds of um, settings um, just with the, the actual training that you leave with. Um, so for the median salary, um, we uh, this is our first year that our students are required to take the, the uh, dental assisting national board. So that increases your um, median salary from uh, 15 to 16 up to $20 an hour, depending on where you're working. Um, some offices uh, offer insurance, but that really just depends on the office. So you have medical and dental insurance, um, but usually if you, they offer dental insurance, you get your free dental work from your office that you're working at or discounted. Um, so there's lots of things that set our program apart from other dental assisting pro programs. Um, the dental assisting program at IVCC is one of five um, de accredited dental assisting programs. So we have a lot of things that we have to do to make sure that we are teaching you up to standards. Um, from there, we're the only uh, program in Illinois that offers expanded functions training. So when you leave from our program, you'll be able to uh, be the only one in Illinois, uh, except for last year students, because they got they were the first ones. They um, can do coronal scaling. They can actually place amalgam and composite restorations by themselves instead of the dentist doing it. Now that's a dental assistant that's actually doing that. So you get that extra hands-on training. Um, and we are the only, off, or only school that offers that um, in Illinois as of right now. Um, so we kind of go with the uh, law and follow that along. And each year I meet with the ISDS and hopefully change and get you guys more benefits as being a dental assistant. Um, and then the dental hygiene or pre-dental, you, you need to take, you don't have to take the, the dental assisting program, but it does give you points for dental hygiene if you were to apply somewhere else um, or in the future, hopefully at IVCC's dental, dental hygiene program. So Heather, <clears throat> thanks so much for all that. What drew you to the dental field? What, what made you choose that? Um, well, I was 18 and just out of high school and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I found a class that looked interesting. So I, I took my, um, my class in Peoria when I was younger. So I drove there. Um, we actually with um, Lindsay Beach with, is one of the other instructors in the dental assisting program here too. Um, so we took the dental assisting program together and it was just love at first sight, I guess. Um, the first day we just loved it and <laughs> I had never stopped and went on from there. And I went to pre-dental to be a dentist and Lindsay went on to be a hygienist and then I ended up here and it just all worked out perfectly. Cool, thanks so much, Heather. So please, as I said, anybody online, chat in some questions. Um, we'll have some opportunity for that uh, towards the end. So now we are gonna move on to Nick Fish with the 
EMT and paramedic program. And real quick, Nick, if you could start with this, I always mess this up. Could you let me know what's the difference between EMT, EMS, and paramedic? So EMS is kind of the general field, which is emergency medical services. EMT is emergency medical technician, which is kind of the entry level um, into the field. And then paramedic is more like is kind of the advanced level. So everything that the EMT does is reinforced in paramedic. Just you get a, to do a little bit more beyond what um, the EMT can do as a paramedic. Cool, thanks. So I'll, I'll let you take it away. Okay. So our EMT is, like I said, the kind of entry level um, program. It is what is required in the state to work on an ambulance. Um, this is what every EMT hates is the ambulance driver program. Um, paramedic is where you learn to go above and beyond. You're doing more skills. So you're starting IVs, you're giving medications, placing advanced airways, things like that. And so you generally you're spent, your time is spent in the back of the ambulance taking care of the patient. Because of the differences, uh, the EMT program is one semester, so 16 week course. At the end of that course, you will um, be able to sit for the National Registry exam. Upon passing that, you can get your EMT license from the state of Illinois and then start working as an EMT. Uh, when you're working as an EMT, depending on where you're at, you will be in the back with the patient or you may be functioning as a driver. Even if you're just, I don't wanna say just driving, um, that was kind of what led me in there was to get to drive fast and make lots of noise. You're still going to help with patient care. And a lot of places, especially in this area, are working what they call basic life support ambulances. So it's two EMTs um, that are providing patient care. The paramedic class, because it is uh, more skills and more uh, responsibility, is a full year. It starts every year in August and then runs through the following July. During the course of the fall and spring semesters, it's a lot of lecture scenarios, um, hands-on skills, and kind of learning about the role of paramedic. And then in addition to that, there's a few hours of clinical time in the hospital as well as on the ambulance. Uh, by the time it's all said and done, I I want to say there's about 500 hours that you spend in either the hospital setting or in the pre-hospital setting um, working and kind of learning there. The summer semester is an internship uh, they call the capstone portion of the program and that's really where our students start to transition from students to entry-level paramedics. So they're starting to tell the crews they're working with this is what I want you to do. This is what I think is wrong with the patient, coming up with the diagnosis and really providing the care. Prior to that, they're more focused on, you know, doing the skills like starting the IVs, placing the cardiac monitor, uh, or placing the airways and things along those lines. Um, but we reinforce all of the skills in the lab. Uh, we have a great ambulance simulator uh, in our lab, which is outside of having wheels and a uh, spot to actually drive. Uh, stationary is pretty much just like real world ambulance. Uh, it's stocked the same way. I use the IDPH EMS checklist to make sure we have all of our equipment and everything like that. Uh, after completion of the program for EMT and paramedic, you can apply for licensure uh, after passing the national registry exam. The National Registry exam allows you, most states will accept the National Registry exam. So the nice part about getting certified as a National Registered EMT or paramedic is that it kind of opens up if you want to move out of state or um, seek other jobs elsewhere, you have some freedom to do so. Yeah, most of the jobs opportunities are either going to be volunteer or part-time in this area. There are a few full-time departments like Ottawa Fire Department. Um, Peru has some full-time paramedics, so does LaSalle uh, in 1033. When you get more in towards the larger cities like 
uh, Bloomington Normal or up by Aurora, Oswego, or even in towards uh, city of Chicago, you're gonna find more full-time paid departments. Uh, the paid departments are gonna pay higher than what the local fire departments or any EMS agencies can pay. Uh, it's not uncommon for starting salary to be around 50,000. Uh, and then they usually top out at like 100,000 after five years in the full-time departments up by the city. Around this area, it's usually paid hourly anywhere between 13 and $15 for an hour for an EMT and then paramedics gender be 15 to $20 an hour. Um, you can work, most paramedics are gonna work on ambulances. Uh, there's a few hospitals that will use paramedics in their ER as patient care techs. My wife does that up at uh, Valley West and Sandwich. And then most of the EMS agencies in this area have critical care transport. So after you become a paramedic, uh, I think it's like two years after that, you can take some more classes and learn some of the more in-depth stuff of um, taking care of some of the sick people, really sick people and transporting them from like our local hospitals to Peoria. Um, there are some opportunities for air ambulances, whether that be helicopter or fixed wing as well. And when you get to the critical care level, then it starts to increase your pay a little bit more. And I think that was it, unless you had any questions for me. No, nope, you, you got it covered, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So we are going to turn it over now to Katie Ritter with um, our medical assisting program. Um, Katie, go ahead and take it away. All right. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm the program coordinator for the brand new medical assisting program at IV. Um, so for requirements for the program, we are for right now a limited admissions program. Um, seats are open to, um, I believe 2022 is gonna be 18. Um, so we'll start accepting applications for that on May 1st um, through October 15th. We will take applications similar to dental. We'll take them after the 15th. And if, you know, seats are open or somebody decides they can't come or whatnot, we'll take some late applications for that program as well. Um, there are a couple prereqs that... Um, are required for the program and they can either be taken prior to the beginning of your program or along with your first spring semester. So that would be um, bio 1200, which is anatomy and physiology, or I'm sorry, not anatomy, <laughs> human body structure and function. And then the ALH 1001 is medical terminology. So if you were considering um, starting the MA program next year in spring 2022, you could either take both of those classes along with your first CMA class, or you could take those sometime during this year, either uh, summer or fall semester to kind of get them out of the way, um, whatever is you know easiest and works best for you. Um, the program is one year. So it runs January through December. Um, so you would finish in December and graduate with your certificate in May the following year. This is for now, we're just doing a certificate program. Um, there is an opportunity to get an associate's degree in medical assisting. Um, we might look into bringing that in as an option somewhere down the road. Um, but you could always transfer and finish your associates elsewhere. Um, but for now, it is a certificate program. Um, for the learning, it's we're actually very similar to dental as well. We've got the di didactic um, information. So, you know, lecture, um, all that kind of good, boring stuff. Hopefully by 2022, we'll be back on campus. Um, for that portion, at least, as well as the lab portion. Um, so your lab and clinical skills then take place on campus in um, 
I believe we're going to have a new classroom this year, so it'll be in the medical assisting clinical lab. Um, we don't actually bring in um, patients outside of the program for the clinical portion. It's practicing on each other. So you're still getting that practice. Um, it's just that we don't bring in outside patients um, a little bit different than the dental program. Um, but it is a lot of hands-on skills where you learn injections, you learn um, medication dosing, you do vitals, which is, you know, blood pressure, pulse, um, temperature, all that intake stuff. If you've ever been to the doctor and the person that's taking all of your information in the beginning, that's all the stuff that you'd be learning in your clinical and lab time. And then we also have an externship that is the last portion of the program, which is October through December is how you finish that out, um, where you would be placed with a local clinic or physician's office to do 160 hours of hands-on externship experience actually in the field. Um, at the same time you're doing your externship, you also complete what's called a professional development course with me on campus one night a week. Um, but that clinical externship will kind of get you some really good experience. And what's nice is our area, a lot of our clinics have um, our multiple provider clinics, and they're really good about like moving you around through the clinic. So you might get to work with a walk-in setting one day and, you know, a, a psychiatric doctor the next day or a family practice doctor. So you get kind of a really nice um exposure to what you may or may not like. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, like I mentioned already, it is a certificate option or a certificate program for right now. So once you graduate the program, you get your certificate from the school. Um, the successful completion of your certificate from IVCC then allows you to sit for your national certification through one of two certifying um, boards. So that's called, you can get a CMA, Certified Medical Assistant um, Licensure, through the American Association of Medical Assistants. Or you can get what's called a registered medical assistant licensure through the American Medical Technologist. Both are exactly the same um, as far as job opportunities, pay scale, things like that. So there's not much difference other than who's giving you that certification. Um, for job opportunities, we're really used quite a bit across the board, really. Um, so outpatient clinics, which would be like your, um, your typical, you know, doctor's office or a, if you see a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, um, a lot of walk-in clinics especially have popped up in our area lately. So you could be in a walk-in clinic, you could do, um, various types of specialty clinics. So if you're interested in obstetrics, gynecology, gastroenterology, cardiology, neurology, pretty much across the board, we're used just about everywhere. Other than we are not so much used at this point in our area um, in emergency room settings. Um, but I do know in some of the bigger areas like Chicago, maybe Rockford and Peoria use MAs in their um, ER settings. You can also do what's called an MA scribe or a medical assistant scribe, which is you transcribing what's going on during the patient's visit rather than the provider um, typing and taking their notes. You kind of do that for them. So it gives you a lot more of kind of the juicy good details. You get to be in on the whole exam and, and find out all that good stuff. It's really fun actually. <laughs> um, and then you can also just be a receptionist if you wanted to, not just a receptionist, but you could just do that if you wanted to, even though you've got your MA. Um, so yeah, any office, clinic, hospital that has receptionists, you'd be qualified for that as well. 
Um, average salary is about 13 to $17 an hour, depending on um, which organization you're with is what I've found is um, the biggest factor in, in what you're offered as a, um, as a base salary to start out. So it's got some pretty good opportunities. Um, I will say too that I forgot to mention that um, as far as degree opportunities, this also sets you up where you could go on to get a degree in healthcare management. So then that also op opens up a lot of extra opportunities after graduating with your MA. Cool, thanks, Katie. So I'm curious, what is your, how did you end up in the medical assisting field? How'd you end up at IVCC teaching? I actually started, um, I started school at IVCC when I was 17 and I got my EMT license. <laughs> Nick wasn't quite there yet, um, but that's how I started out. And I got my first job in a doctor's office. And back then in the distant past, you were able to get your experience as an MA on the job. So that's how I was trained um, as things changed and progressed and more employers were looking for certified. I went back to school and got my, my CMA license, um, continued on with my bachelor's, but I, I just always really enjoyed being an MA. I had considered nursing and I just, I was kind of like Heather said too, like love at first sight. I just loved it. I love the patient care aspect and um, helping people and the, you know, just really being there for people when they really need it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Okay, so we are going to move on to nursing. So we have uh, Dr. Jen Grobe and Laura Hodgson, and I think Dr. Grobe is going to kind of take it away. And I do have to mention Dr. Grobe has had a lot of long Tuesdays and Thursdays the last couple of weeks um, helping out with the vaccination clinic at IVCC. So um, if you're still awake, Jen, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I have to say thank you to Laura for all of her hard work at those vaccine clinics because she does all the organizing and all the student help and behind the scenes. I just come and hang out and smile and wave and hand out water bottles once in a while. So um, thank you very much. We're really excited to be a part of that fantastic uh, delivery method for, for students to get that hands-on experience and that clinical community experience right now. And um, as most of you know, right now it healthcare is, is all the rage. Healthcare is what's at the top of everyone's mind and nursing, while uh, it's really needed, we have a, a shortage of nurses. We had one before the pandemic. It's even more important now that we focus on healthcare. So um, nursing is a limited admissions program as well. Um, we are about to wrap up our letter of intent season uh, on Thursday. Everything is due uh, by 4.30. So make sure if you are interested in the program that you have filed your letter of intent by Thursday. Uh, we do have some core courses that center around the basic knowledge students need to have coming into the program, anatomy and physiology, psychology, English, uh, and students can take those along with the program, but we really recommend that they take those courses ahead of time to give them the best knowledge and, and um, availability to come into the program and free up their time to really focus on those, um, those skills they're going to need in nursing. Uh, we have two tracks. We have the LPN, which is a year, and then the prerequisite courses, of course. Um, they both start in the fall. The RN as well starts in the fall. So the students take those courses, um, at the same track that first year, and then the LPNs are um, taking a summer course and then completing and taking their NCLEX PN. We have a very high success rate um, on that licensure exam. So that's very exciting. We are very pleased with our student outcomes. And then the RNs go on to take a second year of nursing courses where they hone those skills and go on to earn their RN. And again, we have high pass rates in the, that program as well. And we're just really proud of our student success, even with all of the obstacles that have been put in their way with the pandemic, remote learning, uh, changing in their clinical schedules. Uh, we're just really excited to um, continue to offer the, the program to students and to have them back out in the hospital starting in March. We do the didactic 
program. We also have laboratory and clinical skills. Um, we offer a preceptorship program at the end of the RN program. So they get paired up with a nurse out at the uh, hospital site. And uh, we're just really pleased with the, um, with the nursing students within the community that they are so involved with the hospitals that are right here in our area. And many of them are hired right into the area and then go on and earn their bachelor's degree while they're working um, as RNs in the in the community. So, uh, Laura, do you want to add anything to about the admission requirements? Maybe Laura's on mute. Um, I think, so I think that's we, the connection we problem. Move on to oh, the next. Yeah. I did. I had a very bad connection problem like four times, but I just wanted to add that we did a survey many years ago and it was 98% of the nurses that staff the hospitals in our area are from our program. So just a wonderful turnout, wonderful percentage and um, very happy that the hospitals really support our program. We have a great relationship with the hospitals in our area and we hope to continue that. Uh, we've been a real um, supportive partner with the health department, which uh, has been fantastic for our students to get that hands-on care. But um, I see the smiles every Tuesday and Thursday on the staff and the volunteers' faces when the students arrive to do those injections. I heard a student say today that she gave over 30 injections. So uh, we're just really pleased with, uh, with our students and our community partners. And uh, we think that nursing is the best career. Uh, students can go on and earn their um, LPN and they can move forward into the registered nurse program right here at Illinois Valley. But we have so many partnerships and opportunities for students to continue their education. And I say there's never a day that goes by that you shouldn't learn something new. So uh, we're continuing to offer that support for students. They have limitless job opportunities where they can go on to work in that fast paced emergency room. They can slow it down and work in a clinic. Uh, they can work in long term care, which is exploding in our area as far as those needed skills for uh, the, the care in the home and, and in the facility. And um, this uh, here says that median salary here, we're looking at, it varies. Uh, we've got students of, of a variety of backgrounds. So you're starting off in the nursing home, um, you're starting off in a clinic salary. It's gonna be a little bit less, that fast paced night shift uh, nurse is gonna make a little bit more, but um, I, I was reading um, just this past week that nursing has once again been uh, touted as one of the most respected and um, highly um, ethical careers to choose from. And so we're just really honored to be able to offer that for our students. Laura, anything to add? Anything I forgot? No, absolutely. You did a wonderful job. No? Thanks. We have a great team and uh, I hope that students feel like they can call and work with our counselors to um, move forward into any of these healthcare careers. We're really blessed to have so many focus um, areas that students can choose from and they can move from that CNA program into any of the programs mentioned today. Um, they can also uh, take this these uh, gen ed courses and move forward into a number of bachelor's degree programs that we want to support like healthcare administration and business administration that are that also support the um, healthcare folks on the back end and um, in those non patient care areas. So um, Illinois Valley is a great place to go. And uh, we hope that students feel like they can reach out to any of us and ask those questions. Thanks so much, Jen. So um, now we're going to go to therapeutic massage with Roxanne Cherpesky. So Roxanne, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Roxanne, and I am the Therapeutic Massage Program Coordinator. And I just want to start off by sharing um, how I came to um, know and love massage. It was actually by getting my first massage. And I received my first massage from Sherry Monteristelli, who went on to start the program here at the college. And I after that massage, I fell in love with it. Um, she started the program about a year and a half later. And I um, definitely was, I was signed up for the first class. I graduated in 2000 um, from the very first, very first graduating class. Um, and I proceeded to become uh, a lab assistant and then an instructor. And now I'm in Sherry's role as program coordinator. So I kind of came full circle. Um, into uh, the career of, of therapeutic massage. Um, the program requirements, we actually have no pre-admission um, courses that are required right now. 
Um, we do recommend that you take um, the Bio 1200 class just to give you that scientific background. Um, it used to be a prerequisite, but we did um, um, drop that for now. Um, basically, you just need to get an application from admissions, from the therapeutic massage department or counseling and fill that out. Um, you need to receive two professional massages um, and have a receipt of those to turn in with your application. Take the reading and English placement tests and uh, provide a written essay. And the um, uh, requirements for the essay are in the application packet. So basically just put all that together and we start accepting applications um, after January 1st for the fall start. It is a program that uh, can be completed. The certificate can be completed in one year full time, or we do have a part time option that it is two years. So either one year full time or two years part time um, classes run from August to July. So it's three semesters, fall, uh, spring and summer. Um, what you'll be learning, we do have the classroom lecture. We have the hands on lab component. Um, we have clinical. Uh, spring and summer semesters where you're working on the community. Um, lately, it has just been working on faculty and staff on campus at the college due to COVID, but hopefully we'll be able to open that up and offer that to the community again um, once things ease up a little bit. Um, some of the things that you learn, um, you learn um, anatomy, physiology, you study the musculoskeletal system, um, there's pathology because as a massage therapist, you need to be familiar with different pathologies enable, to enable you to work safely with different populations. Um, there is um, kinesiology, there um, is business and professional ethics um, classes that you take. Uh, there's a huge focus on self-care, so you'll experience some different um, uh, movement therapies such as yoga and tai chi that can be incorporated to help you develop good body mechanics so that you can have a long career in massage because massage is a very physically demanding um, profession so that you need to make sure that you are strong physically and mentally um, and we make sure that we address that within the the program itself um, let's see um, we do have three different options in the uh, therapeutic massage program. You can get your certificate in therapeutic massage with opportunity for licensure. And that is the one year or two year full time part time option. Once you complete that certificate, you can go on to receive an advanced certificate in therapeutic massage, which is basically just two more semesters. One is chronic conditions. The other is orthopedic assessment. So once you complete your basic certificate, get your license, then you can go ahead and get the advanced certificate with just two more semesters, which enables you to work more fully in the medical profession, the medical profession, healthcare facilities and that type of thing. And then there's also an associates option. So you have three different options with the uh, massage program. Many different areas that you can work in as a massage therapist. Um, many people in this area, many therapists uh, have a private practice where you basically have your own office. Um, you have you schedule your own clients, you're in um, charge of your entire business practice, lots of flexibility there. Um, no benefits, you know, so there's pros and cons flexibility, but really no benefits, no insurance, things like that. So you have to have kind of a good business mind to have your own um, your own practice, which you do um, have a section on business within the program. So that will help you. Um, chiropractic offices are employing massage therapists like crazy. It's one of the highest paying positions for massage therapists. So that's a really good um, area for massage therapy um, students to go into. Um, integrated healthcare clinics, health clubs, uh, athletic facilities. There's a specialty of sports massage that you can get a certification in to work with athletes. Um, there are certifications in prenatal that you can work with um, pregnant women, um, oncology, you can work with cancer patients. So there's just a huge 
um, range of, of options for you as a massage therapist. Um, there are also um, spa um, opportunities. There are day spas, destination spas, where you do more of the body treatments, um, more relaxation massage. Uh, there are quite a few massage therapy franchises now, such as Massage Envy. Um, there's Elements, Hand and Stone Massage, where in those type of, of uh, venues, you would actually get insurance. Um, they offer vacation pay. So when you work for a franchise, you do have, you, you make less hourly but you actually get more in terms of benefits, you know, health insurance, um, paid vacation and that type of thing. Um, and then you can also go to um, your client's workplace. It's called an out call. So you would either take your massage chair or your massage table and perform the massage on site at um, wherever your client lives or it could be a business um, that you can do your out call to. And that is actually one of the most um, well-paying um, types of uh, work environments is going on site to the client's workplace. Uh, the median salary, it, it, it's kind of a big range. A lot of massage therapists work part-time, which is really nice if you, you want that flexibility to be able to work part-time, you know, if you have young kids, um, you know, maybe older parents you're taking care of, lots of flexibility as far as how much you work. Um, the median salary is between 25 and 35,000 a year, and it can get as high as um, up into the 50,000 area for the more medical um, healthcare uh, venues. And the median hourly uh, works out to be about maybe 20, $22 an hour for um, your salary. Great. Thanks so much, Roxanne. And I'm glad you mentioned the physical component of it because I imagine most massage therapists have Popeye forearms. Um, <laughs> no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sure it is a ton of work. So before I turn it over to Renee, um, Heather, you posted in the chat about the AAS, AAS option. I just wanted to give you a moment to, to bring that up. Yes, I totally forgot to add that into this this PowerPoint. Um, but yes, we do have an AAS in dental assisting. It's brand new, so it's still fresh in there. Um, we're still filling out some paperwork for ICCB, but it is uh, we can start advertising that to our students. So after you finish that, pro, um, that dental assisting program, then there's just a few gen eds that you would uh, take and then get your AAS in dental assisting. Um, again, you'll get extra points if you went on to hygiene, but also then you can move on to every anything else as well and you'll have that AAS. Um, and we also have two mini certificates that I didn't mention. Um, so like I said before, if you just rather not um, work in the back and you don't like all the saliva or blood or anything like that, <laughs> you can work in the front. Um, and then the mini certificates are dental office management. So there's a basic and an advanced. So you could be uh, an, a dental administrative assistant up, up at the front as well. All right. Thanks so much, Heather. Yep. So anybody who's watched one of these presentations with me has probably heard me screaming multiple times about why it's so important to talk to a counselor. So I wanted to turn it over to Renee Prine, one of our counselors, to talk about why students should, should meet with her. So Renee, take it away. You can meet with me or any one of our amazing <laughs> counselors. <laughs> so um, we have um, a great counseling staff that is well-versed in all of the programs that you heard about tonight. And I've used the services of many of these programs that we've talked about tonight. Um, including x-rays in our dental lab, including Roxanne as a traveling massage therapist. And, uh, you know, hopefully not Nick is the EMT. I prefer <laughs> not to, um, but, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. But we will work with you to create um, an academic plan based on your interests. Talk to you about what you need to gain entrance to limited admission programs, what you need to apply to other programs, courses that if you're not quite ready to apply, what we can get to prepare you so you can be most successful once you start the program. Um, all of our instructors are extremely, if you haven't figured it out, passionate about what they do. They love being here at IVCC and you know we do too. That's I was just telling Dr. Grobe last week that I think our youngest counselor um, who is Gary, 
has maybe been with us for about five years, but the rest of us have all been there almost over 20 years, each of us. So um, we have a lot of experience with all of these programs, um, with the requirements. And what's great about these programs is these programs adapt to change. So as things are coming out, you know, new and improved in their fields, they're making changes to their programs to adapt accordingly. And so you're getting the latest and the greatest in all of these programs to get you the best outcome, which is a job once you're done with school um, at IDCC. So by talking to a counselor, um, we will get you the first steps that you need in the process towards becoming a student at IDCC. And if you're already a student, then we can talk to you about what you may have already taken that may work towards some of these programs. So, you know, anything and everything's on the table, no question too big or too small. And if we don't know the answer, we reach out or refer you to the program coordinators themselves. So. Thank you, Renee. That was super helpful. Um, so I, I opened it up for questions in the chat. Um, I just saw something come through now. Um, so Sarah said, um, when do you recommend sending a nursing letter of intent before or after prerequisites? So this is one area where I actually feel like I know the answer in the midst of all the rest of the experts because the admissions office handles the nursing letter of intent. So again, I'm going to de default back to talk with a counselor, talk with Renee or one of our other counselors, because they'll be able to kind of line out your academic plan. But what I can tell you is the typical timeline, the one I'd recommend is students have to take those five core courses. So I listed bio 1007, eight, nine, and then ALH 1000 and 1002. They're all kind of bio and, and health type courses. They take those their first year at IVCC along with English, along with sociology, um, along with any of the other courses that are in there in psychology. Um, at that point during their first year, students will submit that letter of intent while they're in the midst of taking those prerequisites. So again, that's the typical timeline, but as, as you, you know, I always say everybody's plan is different. Everybody's path is different. Um, and, and that's why they should talk to a counselor. And so helpful for Renee to type that in and <laughs> CNA. CNA is one of our prerequisites because our nursing program wants you to know what you're getting yourself into. So you have to complete that CNA prior to being accepted into the nursing program. So, you, so you'll want to fit that in to your academic plan. Renee, anything to add to that? No, I think that was all great advice. We'll work with you. We just need you to be um, college level writing eligible, a certain level of math eligible, those five courses, and you know, hopefully we, the CNA course, and we can work with you on the rest. But we can lay out a plan, whether you're full time, part time, whether you're aggressive with your plan, or whether you're kind of kicked back because you got other obligations. That's our job. You know, Renee and I were just talking this past week about all of the opportunities for students to um, to change their mind. And as a student who changed her mind several times my freshman year, I really like the option that our students start with those general education courses that really go towards anything. So they start with those basic core courses. We hope they don't change their mind from nursing, but we know that what's great about those core courses and the, the support courses that are the gen eds for nursing as as they are for the other programs that have associate degrees or certificates. They work toward the um, towards that bachelor's program down the road. And we're really excited to be able to offer a number of partnerships so that students can take those core courses and then continue to work towards what their, their ultimate plan is. And then Sarah said, when do you recommend taking CNA? We offer it every eight weeks. So take it whenever it works for you because it's a pretty heavy duty course. So we want students to find the time the state doesn't care that um, your birthday party is on a Tuesday night, you still gotta go to clinical. So find a time when you can dedicate eight solid weeks to attending class and clinical. We offer it in the summer, we offer it every eight weeks. So whatever works best for you, uh, Sarah, we, we'd love to have you in class. And uh, you can call us tomorrow if you want and we can get you set up for a class, ready to go for the second eight weeks. 
Absolutely. And I think Sarah too, so, you know, if you're a current high school senior, summer is an, is a great time to take that CNA course because this upcoming fall, you're going to be taking the bio 1007, the anatomy and physiology one. And then in the spring, you're going to be taking a nat and phys two and microbiology and, and you're going to have a full plate. So summer is a wonderful time to get that CNA out of the way. It also gives you the opportunity to, yes, it is accredited. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to gain employment as a CNA. And I can tell you, and Laura and Dr. Grobe, you can speak to this, but our students that have experience as CNAs are much more comfortable with patient care. They, they have a better, they're not as nervous going into the program. It's still a tough program, but they're not as nervous coming in because they've had that patient care and they know a little bit about what to expect and have been working in the field, even if you can pick up on every other weekend shift. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well said. Um, yeah, and so I, I'd also like to add, I think Renee mentioned it and, and somebody else, and I apologize, um, but all of the programs here tonight, they also have advisory committees too. So they're working with businesses and community members to figure out what is good about the program, what needs improvement and how to make those improvements. So it's a situation where all of the programs on tonight are meeting with those in the community, meeting with those in the business uh, community to find out how to make the program better. Um, so it's constant improvement, which is really cool. I just wanna give a quick um, update on the next few academic showcases coming out before we um, call it a night and We've got Applied Technology coming up February 23rd. That's basically all the career and technical education programs. Um, Dr. Shane Lang will be talking about that. Um, Sarah, I'll get to your question in one second. You've got some fantastic questions, as Renee said. We've got Accounting and Business on March 3rd. We've got Agriculture and Cannabis Production on March 9th. And then we have Arts and Sciences on Tuesday, March 23rd. So that's Arts and Sciences is gonna be kind of liberal arts type transfer majors. So um, I'll defer to one of the experts, but what is an average annual starting salary for a nurse in Bureau County? Well, well if you're, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, if you're from Bureau County, you have a lot of options. You can either go north, south, east, west, what, where, however you wanna go. Um, and it depends which way you're going to go, but um, it, it's kind of a tough question to ask because it depends on if you have any more certifications after a program. It just depends what shift you're going to work, just like Dr. Grove mentioned. Um, it, it just it really depends where you want to go. But from Bureau County, you're kind of really, you know, you're in the middle of everything. So you could go any direction. Um, I don't know, Dr. Grobe, well, 20. I mean, hospital is probably 25, uh, 26. It really depends on what shift. Um, nursing home, a little bit less. Office, you know, in that in that ballpark. But truly, you know, healthcare workers now can name their price. So um, get started and get moving forward. And the, the pay increases exponentially with um, experience and time and shift work and more certification. So I would say that's a pretty good ballpark answer, but it's again, the, the location and where you wanna be at is really gonna determine that starting salary. All right, thanks for that. So um, as I just put in the chat, please to, to get in touch with any of the program coordinators here tonight, to get in touch with a counselor, whatever, they've all got their individual contact info. However, if you just give us a call or text us at 224-0439, that's the main admissions line, we can get you in touch with who you need to be in touch with. Um, and so I'll just, in closing, um, Renee mentioned the fantastic program coordinators we have on tonight. They've all put in a full day and they're still willing to give up their time tonight to, to talk with students about their program. And so it's just a really good example of how they're gonna do everything they can to help you succeed if you decide to come to IVCC. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I don't, I'm assuming that's what the kids call it now, tuning in. Um, but anyhow, again, thanks to all our program coordinators. Thanks to Renee. And we hope everybody has a great night. Thanks so much. Thanks. And Thank I'm you.
still figuring out Zoom. And now I have 